Quite lately, I was cataloguing the manuscripts in the library of another Cambridge college. Sir, I put this aside for you. Good gracious. It was an old tin box, scuffed and dusty. Its label, much faded, was thus inscribed. Papers of the venerable Archdeacon Haynes, bequeathed in 1899 by his sister, Miss Letitia Haynes. That must be the Archdeacon Haynes, who came to a very odd end at Barchester. I read his obituary in the Gentleman's Magazine. May I take the box home? By all means, sir. I never looked inside it myself. Really? I'm surprised. I would have been overwhelmed with curiosity. I took the box home and examined its contents. The materials were, of course, mainly journals and letters left by Dr. Haynes, who took up his position as precentor at Barchester with his sister in the year 1895. The archdeaconry had long been the object of his wishes, but his predecessor, Archdeacon Pulteney, refused to depart until he had attained the age of 92. About a week after a modest festival in celebration of that 92nd birthday, there came a morning when Dr. Haynes hurried cheerfully into his breakfast room, rubbing his hands and humming a tune, but was checked in his genial flow of spirits by the sight of his sister. What? What is the matter? Oh, oh John, you've not heard. The poor dear Archdeacon. The Archdeacon? Yes. Ill, is he? He is dead. They found him on the staircase this morning. It's so shocking. Dear, dear, poor Pulteney. It seems to have been all the fault of that stupid maid of theirs, Jane. But how was the maid at fault? Well, as far as I can make out, there was a stair rod missing, and she never mentioned it. And the poor Archdeacon set his foot quite on the edge of the step, and you know how slippery that oak is, and it mm -hmm. seems he must have fallen almost the whole flight and broken his neck. Of course, they'll get rid of the girl at once. I never liked her. <laughs> Miss Haynes's grief resumed its sway, which prevented her observing her brother, who, after standing in silence before the window for some minutes, left the room and did not appear again that morning. Some weeks later saw the preparations for Haynes's elevation to the archdeaconry. This will be your stall, archdeacon. Thank you, Samuel. <clears throat> My... Well, that's very fine woodwork. Local carpenters are named Austin, from timber procured from an oak copse in the vicinity. May I draw your attention to these, sir? As you can see, the prayer desk is terminated at the eastern extremity by three small but remarkable statuettes in the grotesque manner. <sighs> that's an extremely fine cat. Mm. Supple, vigilant, and beautifully carved. The cat's the least of it, see here. How very odd. A figure seated on a throne and invested with the attributes of royalty. Ah, but it is no earthly monarch huh? the carver has sought to portray. Look at his head. Curving horns, prick ears. And those hands are talons. A ghastly image of Satan himself. Hmm. As to the third ornament, perhaps the one we should fear most, as we will all meet him on the last day. It's a monk, surely. The head is cowled and a knotted cord descends there about the waist. There's no cord. A halter, sir. Look. <gasps> oh, heavens. The rent flesh upon its cheekbone. The king of terrors. Death himself. Why? Why the halter? The oak that was cut down to provide wood for these stalls was older than the rest and known by tradition as the hanging oak. When it was felled, a quantity of human bones was found in the soil about its roots. Watered in blood, you might say. At this juncture, it might be advisable to turn to the Archdeacon's diaries. August the 30th, 1896. Now that the Archdeaconry papers are reduced to order, I must find some further employment for the evening hours of autumn and winter. It is a great blow that Letitia's health will not allow her to stay through these months. But as time goes on, I see a shadow coming over him, destined to develop into utter blackness. He commits a good deal of his fears and troubles to his diary, and I am much mistaken if he has told all that he might have. October the 11th. Candles lit in the choir for the first time at evening prayers. It came as a shock. 
I find that I absolutely shrink from the dark season. November the 17th. During the Magnificat, I was, I regret to say, almost overcome with sleep. My hand was resting on the back of the carved figure of a cat, which, of the three figures on the end of my stall, is the nearest to me. I was not aware of this, for I was not looking in that direction until I was startled by what seemed a softness, a feeling as of rather rough and coarse fur, and a sudden movement, as if the creature were twisting round its head to bite me. Ah! Archdeacon, is anything wrong? No, I thought something, and I don't know. Not a splinter, I hope, sir. Oh, no. No, no, not not a splinter. These carvings really are excellent. December the 6th. I do indeed miss Letitia's presence. I get an uncomfortable impression when going to my room that there is company of some kind. The fact is, I may as well formulate it to myself, that I hear voices. But it cannot be. January the 1st. My trouble is, I must confess it, increasing upon me. Last night, upon my return after midnight from the deanery... Stevens? Are you still up? Ah, I've been left a candle. How generous. I do so hate negotiating these stairs in the dark. <laughs> Even with efficient stair rods. <laughs> Let me wish you a happy new year. Ah, ah, my camel! Ah, 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 ah. I crept in complete darkness back down the stairs. Take care. Remember ah. the poor archdeacon. Ah, ah, ah. There's something touching my legs. There is something moving beneath my feet. <laughs> sir? Uh, Stevens! What were you doing coming down the stairs in the dark, sir? I left candles and matches. Quick! Close the door! Trap it! Trap what, sir? The cat! I, I think it was a cat. It may have been larger. There's no cat here, sir. Huh? January the 15th. A curious thing last night, which I should like to forget. I worked in the library from about nine to ten. The hall and staircase seemed to be unusually full of what I can only call movement without sound. Which I hope your grace may be pleased to ratify at the next meeting of the chapter. There is nothing there. There is nothing there. Next meeting of the chapter on January the 18th. Uh, All right, Stevens, I haven't forgotten. I'm just finishing the letter. Uh, Of course you may. You can wait while I finish, then take it straight to the bishop. Obediently, J. Haynes, Archdeacon. There. I know it's late, but he won't mind. What the... Stevens? Is that you, Stevens? I was just coming for the letter, sir. The letter you wish me to deliver to the bishop? Is... Is there anybody else in the house, Stevens? Not that I'm aware, sir. (sighs) I must be firm. At this point, I digress to include a document which, rightly or wrongly, I believe to have a bearing on the story. The account books of Dr Haynes show, from a date but little later than that of his institution as Archdeacon, a quarterly payment of £25 to J.L. Nothing could have been made of this had it stood by itself, but I connect with it the following dirty and ill-written letter which was in a pocket in the cover of the diary. Dear Sir, I have been expecting to hear of you these last weeks, and not having done so, must suppose you have not got mine, which was saying, how me and my man had met in with bad times this season. This being the sad case with us, if you would have the great liberality to send £40, otherwise steps will have to be took, which I should not wish. 
as you was the means of me losing my place with Dr. Poultney, I think it is only just what I am asking. And you know best what I could say if I was put to it, but I do not wish anything of that unpleasant nature. Your obedient servant, Jane Lee. January the 30th. I am much troubled in sleep. Tonight, I fell asleep, but was awakened with a start by a feeling as if a hand were laid upon my shoulder. To my intense alarm, I found myself standing at the top of the lowest flight of the first staircase. The moon was shining brightly enough through the large window to let me see that there was a large cat on the second or third step. Yes, mine is a heavy burden. I know that what I have done is a sin, but I firmly believe I acted for the best. That is my best guess at that final sentence. The words have been scratched out. February the 11th. Letitia left me today. I must be firm. These words, I must be firm, occur again and again on subsequent days. Sometimes they are the only entry. In these cases, they are in an unusually large hand and dug into the paper in a way which must have broken the pen that wrote them. February the 26th. A dreadful night. But I will cower no more. I will venture onto the stairs and face whoever or whatever it is that threatens my sanity. That is the final entry in the diary. But tucked inside the cover is this piece of parchment and a note from Haynes's manservant. I found him. God help me. Lying at the foot of the stairs with his back broken and his face ripped to shreds as if by a wild animal. They accused me, of course. But I was at my Annie's and had my alibi. Otherwise, it's my belief they would have had me swung for his murder. But I'll swear on my salvation I know what did for him. I was one who helped clear out the old church furnishing some years after Haynes's death. When we was pulling down the archdeacon's stall, the carved figure of death split open and this parchment fell out. I've read his diary. His death was earned. I have the parchment in my possession still. I believe it refers to the hanging tree of old Samuel's recollections. It reads thus. When I grew in the wood, I was watered with blood. Now in the church I stand. Who that touches me with his hand if a bloody hand he bear, I counsel him to beware, lest he be fetched away, whether by night or day, but chiefly when the wind blows high in a night of February. <laughs> In the stores of Barchester Cathedral by M.R. James, dramatised by Neil Brand, M.R. James was Mark Gatiss, Archdeacon Haynes, Sean Baker, Letitia, Carolyn Pickles, Stevens, Cameron Percival, Samuel, Michael Burtonshaw, Jane, Saffron Coomber, and Runciman, Lewis Bray. The director was David Hunter. <laughs>